Hi guys, it's me, Chazer HD, and welcome to the first podcast for, I can't remember how long it's been, it must have been just over a year since the last one, and what we're here to do today, for the first time in a while, is we are going to review the 2020 Formula 1 season, because of course we haven't done that yet, and I'm bringing on Nib today, again, for the first time in a while, to review the 2020 season, go through all the teams and drivers, how, you know, we thought they did, um, after, you know, we've had a bit of time to think about it, and also get into some of the races and the best moments and all of that. Yeah, hopefully you guys will, uh, in the comments, share your thoughts as well. But yeah, we're going to get into that today. Uh, also, great to see all you guys in the comments who I'm sure are commenting uh, right now. But let me bring in Nib. Nib, how are you doing, mate? And um, yeah, how, on reflection, I guess we'll start off with, how was the 2020 season for you compared to what you were expecting it to be going into the season? Well, I mean, after the first race, of course, didn't happen in Australia. I don't think we expected much of a season. So uh, in terms of that, I think it went pretty, pretty well, considering we didn't expect too many races to occur. Uh, I think we can be pretty happy with the season that the the COVID protocols did very well in the the biggest outbreak really was caused by a translator uh, at the Russian Grand Prix, which didn't turn into everything. So I think the teams did a very good job to even get the 17 races done this season. And I think for that, we, we can be very thankful. Absolutely. It was kind of a a miracle that it all went ahead kind of normally. Um, and we got so many races in because I didn't think we would get that many races in. I thought maybe we'd get 10 in, something like that. I didn't think we'd get in um, the amount of races that we did. So it's absolutely fantastic that we did. And we did get, as I said a minute ago, we got some great moments. Um, wouldn't necessarily say some great races, but definitely uh, races that were pretty good at times. And we'll get into those a bit later on. But let's just go. Uh, team by team, and go through uh, the order they finished in. So first off, Mercedes, what else is there to say? Um, they are the best team in Formula 1, obviously. Best team ever. Uh, they have the best car, probably, ever. Uh, the car has no flaws at all. Um, Lewis Hamilton, of course, has had probably... I'm not sure if he drove the best he did in 2020 compared to, say, 2018 or other years like that, but he was pretty flawless. Uh, Valtteri Bottas was kind of 50-50-ish during the 2020 season. Um, had great, you know, pole positions, but then in certain Grand Prix, he was a bit lacklustre. But as a team, I mean, Mercedes, I mean, we knew after pre-season testing, which feels so long ago for 2020, um, about a year ago, um, we knew it was going to be another year where they were going to w be winning titles, but we didn't know it was going to be quite this dominant and superior to everyone else. I mean, it, they basically went back to how they were during, you know, 2014, 2015, 2016. And Nib, I'm sure you'll echo this. This 2020 season just proves, especially with the car they made, just how they are the best team the sport has ever seen, really. Yeah, absolutely. And I don't think there was much doubt in our minds going into the season that they were the greatest uh, Formula One team in history. I think we've been saying this for a little while now, but yeah, I mean, 2020 just reconfirmed everything that we thought that Mercedes were the best team that the sport's ever seen, and they produced the best car that the sport has ever seen and probably will see for some time, of course, with the new uh, new regulations uh, affecting the rear downforce of the car with uh, with the floor changes quite a bit, the cars uh, the cars won't be able to gain back that time. Uh, at least that's what the engineers engineers are saying, and uh, I, you know you'd like to trust them, of course. But yeah, they've they've done an incredible job as per usual. Of course, Hamilton didn't have to be at his best, and you know there was a little little bit there were some more mistakes from Hamilton this season than there had been in years past, but it didn't matter. There wasn't anyone there to challenge him, of course. Verstappen was threatening a little bit earlier on the season, but the Red Bull car was not, not good enough to challenge the might of Mercedes. And, yeah, the Hamilton... Uh, the the Hamilton-Mercedes relationship just proving once again to be the strongest that the sport has ever seen. And I think as long as they continue as a partnership, I don't think that they'll ever quite be uh, the, 
quite be touched. Yeah, I think, sadly, you're p- probably right. It's it's similar to, you know, Schumacher at Ferrari. Um, it, it's just a partnership that, as long as the car is good enough, you just don't see them ever really being stopped because there's no one really out there as a combination that's strong enough, consistent enough over a year to, you know, to be world champions. And as... um. A, People will find out in a video coming up on the channel very soon. My thoughts as to it, I, I just don't see for still quite a bit anyone really being able to properly give Mercedes a proper um, challenge for the championships. But as you said with Red Bull, Red Bull didn't really produce a car that was quite up to it for 2020. And they were, for me, they were the team that I thought were most likely with Max Verstappen being as great as he has been in the last year or two years. I thought that team and driver combination was the most likely to say, I won't say scare Mercedes, but, you know, make them kind of, um, again, kind of fearful that a challenge may be coming for their supremacy. But then we got to the season and the Red Bull car, I and mean, you could see it kind of in testing. We didn't quite know the full pitch as of yet, though. But we saw it in the first few Grand Prix. The Red Bull car just simply wasn't good enough. It wasn't particularly great in terms of grip. The Honda Power Unit in 2020 wasn't wasn't bad, wasn't great, wasn't very good. It was just kind of, you know, at a good enough level to give them you know enough power to perform some overtakes at some you know key times but it wasn't anywhere near really the mercedes power unit so that's why it didn't quite you know meet the standard there uh but yeah just red bull just their overall package that you know they came up with for 2020 just wasn't good enough and i know towards the end of the season they did improve the car and all of that but it just simply still wasn't that great and the only thing really bailing them out in 2020, I'm sure, Nib, um, you think this as well, Max Verstappen is the person who absolutely bailed this team out because without him, I think Red Bull might not have even finished in second in the Constructors. Uh, but yeah, Red Bull, very disappointing, very disappointing. I expected a lot more considering that the regulations were stable, of course, from 2019 to 2020. And Nib... I'm sure going into 2020, maybe you didn't think Red Bull were going to be, you know, winning the championship, but you didn't think they were going to be so far behind uh, pace-wise, you know, three or four races in. Yeah, you know, Red Bull Red Bull had a bit of a disappointing season. I expect them to certainly challenge for a few more race wins than, uh, than what they did. Of course, they got their win with uh, with Verstappen at the... At one of the Silverstone races, I, I could always I can't always can't quite remember the the seventieth anniversary. Which one was was it the seventieth anniversary Grand Prix that he did win? Yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was the seventieth seventieth uh, anniversary Grand Prix which he did win. Um, then of course Abu Dhabi, but yeah, the car just the rear end just a, too unstable. Uh, we saw that even. Uh, the previous season, where Pierre Gasly really struggled with that, where Max Verstappen is comfortable with that, and it'll be interesting to see going into 2021 if Sergio Perez is able to handle that, and of course there isn't going to be as much rear-end downforce next season, so that will be certainly uh, certainly quite interesting to see how that plays out, but yeah, Verstappen had a, had a very, very good season. He could have He could have even been second in the Drivers' Championship um, you know, if you didn't have those, was it four? Was he had four or five retirements this season? I know he retired from the three uh, Italian races. Um, he retired at Monza, obviously he retired at uh, at Imola, up uh, with that puncture, and then obviously at Mugello he had those uh that issue with the power unit off the start. Then he got punted out on the first lap, so he wouldn't have lasted long there. So if Verstappen certainly didn't ha- didn't have too many. And reliability issues. I think he would have been. He could have challenged Bottas for second in the championship. Who I must say did have a very poor season at Mercedes this year. I thought Bottas did. Um, but yeah, ultimately Alex Al- Albon 
He's uh he's gone for twenty twenty one. I think Red Bull had to make the decision. He just you know, he he showed signs at the end of twenty nineteen that he could challenge Verstappen and he could get pretty close. I remember they set the exact same uh lap time in a, at Suzuka qualifying, you know, and Albon has just been too far back, you know. You'd expect him at least a couple of times to get within a couple of tenths, but he only got within, I think, three tenths, or not even that. I think the closest qualifying performance he got to Verstappen was at the last Grand Prix, and he still got out-qualified by McLaren, and in a car that ended up winning the Grand Prix, that's just not good enough, and uh, yeah, I think ultimately Red Bull have made the right decision by putting Perez in that car. For next season yeah i think i think most people would agree with that in terms of perez being the right man considering who was available going forward um with alban i mean yeah alban i gave him many chances uh during the season to really prove me wrong in terms of whether he was good enough for red bull and all of that and there were certain qualifying sessions where i thought you know what he did pretty well even certain races after poor qualifiers where I thought he did pretty well, but he was never able to put in. Never mind a two or three race, you know, in a row in terms of consistency uh, in a good way. Never really able to put a race weekend together, except really pace-wise for the final Grand Prix. But as you said, was out-qualified by McLaren, and McLaren in that Grand Prix were, you know, clearly slower than the Red Bull. So uh, Albon just simply was never able to show, you know, what he does have. And he does have, you know, a lot of talent. I mean, you can see it at times. He is good at overtaking. Um, He does have good speed. He just can't produce it on a consistent basis. And I think the best thing for him is what Red Bull have done. They, you know, making him the uh, test and reserve driver. Not sure, though if he'll be back on the grid for 2022. What do you think, Nev? Do you think he'll be back on the grid? I I just don't really see where he gets back in. I don't think he'd be back in a Red Bull for uh, for 2022, and if he possibly does, I think he could go to Alpha Tauri uh, next alongside Yuki Tsunoda, but, I mean, who knows? Yuki Tsunoda, if he has a good 2021 season, might be in the, 20, in the 2022 Red Bull because uh, Helmut Marco and all of Red Bull do rate him very highly, but I mean Red Bull have got a, a lot of uh, a lot of good drivers in F2. Um, the Indian driver Daruvala, or well, not Daruvala, um, yeah Daruvala. Sorry, yeah he's he's the Indian driver. I, for, I, for whatever reason I got muddled up with uh, Dragovic. Uh, but yeah, I, they've got got quite a lot of talent in F2. Do Red Bull? So who knows if. Um, he might not be back on the grid for 2022, uh, which would be a shame because, as you uh, as you said, he does he does have some talent. That's for sure. It's clear to see, but I mean, just not good enough for Red Bull at this period of his career. And I don't think he was ever quite really ready for it, as we saw even in 2019. Uh, Kvyat was outperforming him before he got put in the Red Bull car at AlphaTauri. To be expected, it's his first season in the sport and whatnot, but. You know, if you're a really super talented driver that deserves to be in a top, top team, he would have been outperforming uh, Danny Kvyat at AlphaTauri immediately. For, for crying out loud, we saw we saw that with super talented rookies like Finet, um, with Hamilton against Alonso. He's certainly not up at that level. He, he's, he's certainly a very solid midfield driver. Um, and we saw that throughout the season, sadly, with his, a lot of his midfield, midfield results um in that red bull but yeah just certainly not ready for a for a big team like uh like red bull yeah absolutely i hope i hope we do see him eventually though because i think if he was to um nail down that consistency a bit more i think he would as you said turn out to be a pretty good midfield driver but we'll have to see what happens with him uh but next up is mclaren who finished third in the constructors a great season for mclaren and I think what makes it even better is that they didn't have the third quickest car during the season. I'd say for most of it, they probably had the fourth or fifth quickest car. I think towards the end of the season, probably the fifth quickest car. McLaren just, they didn't have that, say, compared to Racing Point and Renault. And of course, Racing Point had a quick car for certain reasons. Uh, and Renault had very strong uh, power unit, which of course McLaren did have. 
um, of course, in 2020 as well. But Renault, I think, uh, optimized their great straight line speed a lot more than McLaren did. Um, but yeah, considering that McLaren did not have that great of a car compared to Racing Point and Renault in 2020, I think the result they got from it was great. Um, you know, getting the podiums they did. Carlos Sainz, of course, almost winning the Italian Grand Prix. That was probably the strongest McLaren performance of the season. And I thought, if you look at, you know, McLaren, Racing Point, and Renault in that battle, McLaren, I wouldn't say completely reminded me of them, but reminded me kind of of Mercedes from, say, a couple years ago when Mercedes, of course, were competing with Ferrari for the drivers uh, and constructors' titles in terms of, you know, Mercedes wouldn't always have the best car, but when it came to scoring points, they would execute most times, and that's what led to them, you know, still winning the titles they did. If you look at McLaren... Quite a lot of the time, they didn't have the best car out of those three teams, but they executed on race day. Um, Lando Norris, I thought, had a very good season. It did taper off at times towards the end of the season, uh, but he started off very well. The, you know, the first couple races in Austria were just spectacular. They really, really were. Um, and I, I thought after that, even though, again, it did taper off at times, his results and his performances, I still think he had a very good season. Definitely improved. Um, and still showcased the things he showed in his first season of Formula 1 and was even better in those aspects when it comes to, you know, overtaking and stuff like that. Got to say, though, Carlos Sainz, for me, is the reason why McLaren finished third in the Constructors, because if you look at the way he ended 2020, he was one of the best on the grid. He really was. His results were not just great, considering, you know, the pace of the car and all of that, they were so consistent in terms of, you know, consistently for five or six races in a row, finishing in the top five or six, I think it was. That right there is why McLaren got to where they got to in the constructors at the end of 2020. And considering as well the bad luck Carlos had in the first half of the season, it's remarkable he was still able to have the mental toughness to kick on and have the, you know, great end to the season he did. And to not lose faith. And of course, you know, with him going to Ferrari in 2021 and not downing tools and all of that. Um, yeah, I thought Carlos Sainz had a, a really great season. And yet again, proved, like he did in 2019, why he you know, does deserve the seat at Ferrari. Will be exciting to see what he does at Ferrari compared to Charles Leclerc. But I think even though after testing, we knew, and we'll get to them later, of course, Ferrari were definitely quite a bit slower than they were in 2019. I think you'd have to agree, Nib, that even though McLaren would have known that Ferrari were they, in that midfield battle, they never would have thought, you know, third in the constructors was really a possibility, would they? No, of course, of course not. And, I mean, after pre-season testing, you, you were looking to other teams as well. You know, Renault, maybe not so much after pre-season testing, but certainly Racing Point... They looked very, very strong through pre-season testing. So, yeah, it was a great job by McLaren to ultimately get that third in the constructors. And as you mentioned, ultimately, Carlos Sainz, once again, the difference maker. And I thought, you know, he didn't quite reach the heights of 2019. So I thought he actually his season actually went quite a bit under the radar because you had Ricardo doing very well throughout the season. Um, you know, Leclerc had some standout performances earlier in the year. Of course, Vettel goes podium at Turkey. So I thought Sainz's uh, season went very much under the radar in terms of the midfield drivers. But once again, he, he's done an incredible job as Carlos Sainz. And as you mentioned, he does deserve to be in that Ferrari. And it's certainly much... Uh, it's gonna. I think he's just going to prove himself again uh, coming up for this season in 2021. Um, you know, of course, McLaren were very quick at Monza as well. I think he, he very easily could have won that race, uh, you know, and uh, I thought he still performed very, very well against Lando Norris. The, the two are very close in qualifying, but in the race, uh, more times than not, Carlos is just able to manage uh, to beat Lando. Uh, and I thought Lando made a a pretty impressive step from where especially from 2019 at the start of 2019 he was a bit too cautious in the race and like that but he certainly got a lot more aggressive 
in this season and that's why he had a very good start of course got his podium uh, to start off the season at Austria and uh, yeah I think I think Lando is just showing that he's making good progression and I think obviously next year with uh, my man Daniel Ricciardo I think uh, Lando Norris and Ricciardo are going to make a very strong McLaren team for 2021. Yeah, they they absolutely should. And if McLaren produce a car that's maybe slightly quicker in the pecking order than it was in 2020, and of course, again, Mercedes power unit, which will hopefully for them help, um, McLaren should be pretty strong next season. And I am kind of excited to see uh, what McLaren are like in 2021. But yeah, in 2020, you've got to say, great season. Probably McLaren's best season in terms of the mood and the team and how they performed as a team uh, forgetting the performance of the car probably their best season in maybe you could say since they last won a world championship in 2008 because even though in obviously 2010 2011 2012 they were what second third in the constructors those years they were disappointed with that because they thought they could have done a lot better um but you know considering again where their car performance was and where they finish in the constructors, it's probably the happiest they've been since they won that championship. So this team going forward, and that is just great to see. Uh, next up, though, fourth in the constructors is Racing Point. Now, of course, they had points deducted for the infamous controversy um, of them having essentially a Mercedes B-car. It's not really a secret. They basically did um, have a pink Mercedes. I still think McLaren and Renault... Still didn't have that big of an excuse against, you know, what Racing Point were doing because McLaren and Renault, teams like that, and Ferrari as well, shouldn't really be losing out to Racing Point who, you know, aren't that big of a team. I mean, of course, they're now Aston Martin, so that's going to uh, change quite a bit. But I didn't think they had a, that big of an excuse. But, you know, Racing Point, let's be honest, even though I do like them as a team a lot, they did have certainly an advantage at times uh, in 2020, having as good of a car as they did, um, and that will help them going forward a lot. But you have to say, considering the car they had and the positions they were in in certain Grand Prix, you know, look at Turkey, for example. They're one and two in the Grand Prix and leading by, what, 13 or 14 seconds after five laps? You know, when you consider that, you have to say Racing Point, they bottled third in the constructors. They really did because they had a car that should have not easily had clinched that position, but should have been able to, you know, moderately, say comfortably had got it. But just simply, they weren't able to execute on the car they had, whether it be reliability issues, which they had quite a bit of, um, you know, look at the Turkish Grand Prix again. They were one and two, and then they had the the, the issue with Stroll's front wing. Um, Perez still got a great result, but still could have been a lot better. Uh, Perez, of course, missing a couple races didn't help. Lance Stroll missing a race didn't help. It just, you know, they were never able really that many times in 2020, except for the race they won, to properly execute what they had. And they did have a car that I think was probably, or properly rather, if you discount how great Max Verstappen was, it was probably the second quickest car on the grid. I still don't think the Red Bull car was that quick. I think Max Verstappen was making it look, look a lot quicker than it actually was. And I think the car was, in terms of its setup, you know, very suited towards him. So I don't think the Red Bull car um, overall was that great or that good. So, you know, considering how good the Racing Point car was, you've got to say they bottled it. They had a great chance and they didn't take it. Still, though, considering where they came from in 2019, which was P7 in the Constructors, to go from that to P4 is still a, a great season, but it could have been more. Um, and yeah, just maybe it's because they don't have experience of being that high up the grid so often. Maybe that's it. But they just they couldn't execute couldn't execute and nib i mean we know they're becoming aston martin of course for this season and beyond and maybe they'll be now a regular team in the top three or four of the constructors but 
let's say they're not, they're, they're really going to look back on this season as a really big missed opportunity because not only, you know, did they miss out on third in the constructors, but they could have easily had, couldn't they, more podiums, maybe even a surprise race win along the way. Well, I've just been sitting here for the last couple of minutes uh, nodding my head in approval of basically everything you've been saying. Absolutely <laughs> a massive missed opportunity for the Racing Point to finish third in the Constructors. As you said, they pretty comfortably had the third fastest car, although they weren't super quick in qualifying all the time, but that's because they set their car up to be fast in the race, and certainly they were very fast in the race. You know, there was multiple opportunities where they could have scored a lot, a lot of points, and they ultimately buggered that up of course they got docked the was it 15 world championship points because of um well basically they copied the mercedes brake ducks from the previous season so uh the faa decided to get rid of those 15 points um but i i mean the i mean sergio perez incredible season the best season of his career uh and of course he missed two races with uh after his positive covid test and you know, to still finish fourth in the championship, of course, this is Sergio Perez and the drivers, it was absolutely remarkable. Um, but I think one, a big missed opportunity, certainly with Lance Stroll, because he had an incredible start to the world championship. As they were going into Mugello, I think he was fourth in the world championship at that stage. But then he had his massive, massive crash after the tyre puncture. And then he never really recovered. It, it took him a little while up into the season for him to actually recover and start delivering week in, week out again. So I thought I thought Lance Stroll was just disappointing that second half of the season. I think some of that obviously cost him, uh, cost Racing Point a little bit, of course. Um, unfortunate getting that front wing damage at the Turkish Grand Prix where he very easily could have won or got on the podium, and that would have, that would have made a massive difference, of course. Um, but yeah, I think, I think a lot of credit has to go to Racing Point, you know, I don't think many people would have expected this from the team going, uh, well, I'd say before pre-season testing, to be the third fastest team, you know, of course, Ferrari were disappointing, we'll get onto them in a minute, but, you know, they still did a good enough job, but, of course, they will be disappointed, they'll be looking to build on this from 2021, and arguably, after what was seen over the past year and a bit, a weaker driver lineup. <laughs> Yeah, well, hope I, I, you know, I hope that we get back the, you know, not the real Sebastian Vettel, but Sebastian Vettel of, a, you know, three, four years ago. But you don't know. I mean, Sergio Perez, he, as you said, he was pretty great in 2020, and kind of like Carlos Sainz in that final few Grand Prix of the season, he was at the absolute peak. I think Perez of what he could do absolute peak of what he could do and i thought he was he was great i will say though lance stroll in 2020 as you say end of the season he did taper off and he did disappoint on a few occasions uh the portuguese grand prix was one where he was just all over the place um but this 2020 season and i know of course the car was good there's no doubt about that the car was good I think this 2020 season, to me, has proven, finally, to even myself, because I, of course, doubted Lance Stroll a lot, to the point where I didn't think he was good enough to be in Formula 1 at, you know, the point of a couple years ago. He has proven me wrong. He is clearly good enough to be on the grid. Definitely, at least, a good midfield driver. Maybe even more. Of course, he is still young. He might even, you know, go on to bigger and better things yet. Um. And yeah, I think in 2020, when he was, you know, on it and was in top form, say in Hungary, where of course he qualified third, finished fourth, probably could have got a podium if the race was dry, uh, fully dry, not, you know, wet start and all of that. Uh, got the podium at Monza. In Mugello, he was driving very well until that puncture. Uh, the Spanish Grand Prix was very good. You know, when he was on that form, he was really, really good. Really, really good. I mean, and he was making, you know, me look like an absolute fool for doubting him. Um, but then, of course, had his moments later on the season. But I just want to ask you this, Nib. Do you... Th how, how much further do you think Lance has... 
or can go talent wise in Formula One? Do you think he will just be a good midfield driver or do you think he still has a lot more to show us basically is what I'm trying to ask? I'm not too sure. And of course, people uh, people have listened to this podcast and of course know me very well from this will know that I've been a long time defender of Lance Stroll, that it's mainly been his qualifying that's let him down, that his race pace genuinely is very good. And we're seeing that throughout the throughout the season that, you know, he was certainly just a couple of tenths or so off Perez on race pace. And that's pretty impressive because Perez, of course, has been in the sport for a long, long time. He's a seasoned veteran at this stage as Sergio Perez in his career. And I think that Stroll finally was starting to show his true potential. I don't think, you know, he could go and challenge and be up with one of the big boys, but certainly he could be a very, a very, very good midfield driver. I think I think later on this season, later, not later on this season, later on in his career, he can aspire to be a sort of Sergio Perez and Nico Hülkenberg. Of course, he'd like to score a few, or well, he has scored a few more podiums than Nico Hülkenberg in his Formula 1 career <laughs> so far, but... You know that pole lap at Turkey was was incredible, and uh, that that lap just right there shows that he does have true talent, and that people saying that he didn't have any talent when he first came onto the grid was quite ridiculous. Of course, he's very very raw when he first came on to the grid, and he, I wouldn't say he was. I don't think he was quite ready then. They put him in the car a bit too early, and I thought it was quite unfair on him. But uh, you know, he he really showed this year that he he is made for this level. And uh, he can be a very good Formula One driver. Yeah, he has. Um, and I will say again, he has proven me very, very wrong. Because, again, two or three years ago, I mean, I, I never, I don't think I ever said, and if I did, I was wrong for saying it. I, I don't think I ever said he didn't have enough talent to be in Formula One, but I just didn't think he was good enough to be in Formula One in terms of what he produced. But really since midway through 2019 you have to say if you look at what he's had to drive and what he's done with what he's had and all that done pretty well he's done pretty well and again he's still a young driver so plenty more to come from lance stroll next in the constructors fifth is renault now compared to what me and nib thought renault were going to be like in 2020 in terms of their results in the grand prix and that pretty good season you know couple podiums we never thought that was going to happen daniel ricardo of course great season one of the best drives of the season um and just you know them with daniel ricardo being able to be in the top five or six of a grand prix so often i never thought that was going to happen with renault i thought that again they were going to disappoint and kind of fall off and just not really you know show anything that Special during the season, but of course did later on. Of course, Esteban Ocon finishing second uh, in the Grand Prix in Bahrain, but it was of course a Sakir Grand Prix. Um, but ultimately, it's the same result as 2019, fifth in the constructors. And I think that illustrates that, and now you know Renault as they become Alpine F1, that this Renault project has simply failed. You know, they went from, what was it, ninth in 2016 to 6th in 2017 and then 4th in 2018. Now, if you look at that progression, that's pretty great. That's pretty great. But if you look at what they've done since then, and of course, 2018 to 2019, there was a new set of regulations where Renault really should have kicked on after that. It just hasn't happened. Hasn't happened. They've gone backwards in terms of their results in the constructors, basically. Um... And yeah, even though this season, or not this season, but you know, in 2020, they had podiums, which is better than what they had in 2019 or 2018. Again, same result. Fifth and the constructors, just simply not good enough. And I'm afraid Renault have themselves to blame. They didn't start the season off strong enough. They were too slow uh, to start the season. They didn't really start consistently showing good pace until Spa. Um, and they, you know, left themselves, I think, too many points you know they had to gain too many points to catch up basically to racing point mclaren that's what i'm trying to say and you know they just couldn't do it and they just couldn't do it um ricardo of course was great but even though he was so great you know 
he was never going to drag Renault from fifth to fourth or third of the constructors. It was just simply never going to happen because even though he's a very, very good driver, he's not, you know, that great of a driver to drag that car that far. And as to Ban Ocon, I thought had, I wouldn't say a poor season, but it was just mediocre, I think, at, at best. Um, just underwhelming. I mean, I didn't think he was going to have that great or a very good season, really. But I didn't think it would be this kind of, this meh. That's basically what it was. It was just a very meh season for Esteban Ocon. Didn't really prove that much. Um, of course, at the end of the season, his pace did improve compared to Daniel Ricciardo. But it was way too late. And of course, next season, he's in for a very tough uh, challenge with his teammate Fernando Alonso. But yeah, Renault, I'm sure you'll agree, Nib. You know, with the car they had, especially the power unit they had, maybe not as much as Racing Point, but a, a, a missed opportunity to really gain some ground on teams, you know, like McLaren and Red Bull and that, definitely, wouldn't you say? Yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, you know, this is going to be just a couple of minutes of me frothing over Daniel Ricciardo's season. Um, back to his absolute best, I thought, you know, he's he was still pretty good in 2019, but certainly one of his weaker seasons in the this, in this sport, I thought, um, you know, yeah, he beat Hulkenberg, but he could certainly have done better, you know, and of course, Baku, where he reversed it to Kvyat, you know, it's like that, that summed up Ricardo's season pretty well, I thought, in 2019. It was just, it was just pretty, pretty dreadful, to be fair, for his standards, but absolutely back to his best. He, well, he only got out qualified by Ocon twice this season, and you know, he just absolutely dominated Ocon throughout the whole entire season. Ocon finally started to get closer to him as the season went on, but still in the race, as you've seen, even in Abu Dhabi, you know, he got close to, uh, he got, he had qualified Ricardo, of course, in qualifying at Abu Dhabi, but then Ocon was absolutely nowhere in the race and, you know, having to let Ricardo through for, well, it seems about the fourth time this season. Remember, there was one at Austria, Russia, uh, was there somewhere else where you had to let Ricardo through? I can't remember, but I remember this certainly at least the third time where he's had to let Ricardo through because he's been holding him up. And yeah, I mean, Ocon, he was certainly, he was pretty good. He was pretty good, that's for sure, um, for his return into the sport. But, you know, not quite the level of which many of us quite expected, you know. When he was when he was a younger driver, many touted him to be perhaps driving for Mercedes in the future. And of course, you know, with his connections with Toto Wolff and Mercedes back in the day, that was it seemed like a realistic um, possibility to occur. But yeah, it just I think this season showcased he's not quite at that tippy top level. And you know, Ricardo is up is right there in that upper bracket of top tier Formula One drivers. And yeah, Ocon certainly showed that he's not quite up to that level. But who knows, you know, his second season back in a single-seater car after a year off, he could still continue to improve. And um, against Fernando Alonso, we'll certainly see if that is the case. Now we'll go into the next team in sixth place, Ferrari. Now, this season... I mean, it could have been worse. They could have finished behind Alfa Tauri and been the second best Italian team on the grid, which would have been pretty embarrassing. But, I mean, after pre-season testing, I thought this season was going to be pretty bad. I thought maybe they'd finish, say, fourth in the constructors and they'd be a midfield team and, you know, it just would be a pretty poor season. But I never thought it would be this bad. I mean, the points in the season where I thought they... It couldn't get any bad. Uh, couldn't get any worse. Rather, you know, when we came to the race at Spa, the race at Monza, even Mugello, where the, yeah they did score, I think a point or a couple points. They were just so horrifically bad. I, I think honestly, this season, I mean, and it is their worst season in a long, long time. But considering where they were. Only a couple years ago. I I can't believe they've just dropped you know, dropped off so quickly. 
I, I, and if you look at any other team, when the regulations have been stable, you know, for example, in this example, 2019, 2020, the regulations have been, you know, stable. I can't really think of really any team who have gone from fighting at the front of the field, you know, pole positions, race wins, all of that, and then gone to not even the front part of the midfield pack, but just dead center in the middle of the pack basically at best it has to be the biggest drop off in performance again without a new set of regulations probably ever and of course the you know whole power unit thing didn't help but you know they were breaking the rules so not like it was an unjust thing that happened um their car design went horribly just nothing really went right Nothing really went right, and I'm saving a lot of what I want to say for a certain video that I'm going to make on them before the 2021 season gets underway, but yeah, 2020 was the worst season they've had, I think, was it since 1980? I'd probably say is the worst season Ferrari have ever had, where in that season, I think they only scored like two or three points. Um, and then the year before that, they were, what, one and two in the championship and the drivers and then, you know, constructors, champions and all of that. That was the worst season. But I never thought in 2020, even though I thought it'd be worse than it was in 2019, I never thought it would get that bad to the point where in certain races, they were lucky to beat, you know, the Williams cars. That's how bad they were. I mean, if you look at the Mugello race, if it wasn't for that late red flag. They would have been beaten by Williams. That's how bad it was. That is how bad it was. Uh, they, they were getting almost beaten by a car. They were lapping at least twice during 2019 in every single Grand Prix. How bad of a drop-off is that? And Nib, uh, I mean, again, I'm saving a lot of what I want to say about this team for a later video. But, I mean, just go into your thoughts of just, just how bad it has been. and. I guess where it all, in your opinion, where it all came from, just how bad it, this season was. <laughs> well, I think we know where it all came from. It's from them getting cheated from, well, not from, yeah, well, from them cheating and then getting caught by the FIA. Now, of course, they won't say anything publicly, but you know, whatever they were doing with that 2019 engine, they found out what what they were doing with it. And the FIA had sorted it out, and it was clear to see they were so, so slow on the straights. Of course, they did have to make sort of a makeshift engine very quickly before the start of the season, after they said, nah, -uh, you're not having this engine. Um, so, yeah, obviously, their engine was massive, massively slow. They did improve the car just a tiny little bit compared to the other season, but because they had to run... An, so much uh, less downforce than everyone else. They were just uh, absolutely nowhere. It just completely threw out all of the balance of the car. And uh, a, quite a miracle that they actually managed to score two podiums. Of course, Charles Leclerc, what a season he had in that Ferrari. Absolutely incredible. He he beat Sebastian Vettel silly uh, all season long. I've, I've never seen Vettel beaten that bad in his career. Of course, he got beat by Ricardo. In uh, at Red Bull in 2014, but geez, it was never this bad. Where where Vettel was six tenths off Leclerc, like a lot of times in qualifying. You know, it it was remarkable to see Sebastian Vettel struggle that much. And you know, I, you know, of course, you know, I was not a huge Sebastian Vettel fan. Of course, when he's teammates with Mark Webber, but I've grown to to really love and respect Sebastian Vettel for everything he's done, for the man he is off track as well. Um, so it's just sad to see, and I really, really do hope that he can rediscover his magic spark and his magic touch at Aston Martin because, you know, he, he is a legend, and um, I, really, I really hope he can, but... Yeah, Charles Leclerc, what a season. What a season from him. Um, the per But I must say, although he did have a very good season, there was some mistakes which he made, of course, when uh, both the Ferraris crashed 
at Austria. You know, that was a pretty horrible mistake. And then, of course, once again, just risking it um, at the, in the Sakir Grand Prix. Of course, when they crashed up at Turn 4, uh, when he crashed into Perez. Just, once again, a few little mistakes, which I think will... Um, which he will rectify over the coming years. I, I seem very similar. He isn't quite as raw as Verstappen when Verstappen came into, into F1, but sort of making very Verstappen-esque mistakes, like just being a little bit too impatient, trying to get too much done too early. And that could be coming out of desperation purely because of how far back they've qualified, but in the Sakir Grand Prix, no real excuse there where they actually had a pretty decent qualifying after he put in a... Oh, where where is his pol where is his lap where he got fourth? Was that the short short Bahrain Grand Prix or the actual proper Bahrain Grand Prix? That was some some lap and meanwhile Vettel was down, you know, not even getting into Q threes and that just showed the difference between the two drivers. So it was really hard really hard to get a proper gauge of where the Ferrari car was for this season, but it was absolutely awful and I mean they deserved to finish in the place where they did in the constructors. Absolutely, and I think if you look at the drivers, I mean, Leclerc was great, and Sebastian Vessel was definitely not on form this season, but I think it wasn't just down to the drivers. I think Leclerc, I mean, he's improving all the time, getting better every single year, is improving in every single area, but I do, I do think because he is now the number one driver going forward until maybe Carlos Sainz proves something in 2022 or beyond that, I, th I do think, kind of in a similar way to Verstappen at Red Bull, the car, I won't say completely, but was kind of shifted in terms of the setup of the car towards what Charles Leclerc prefers. And I think that definitely did mess with Sebastian Vettel's performance. I still think Sebastian wasn't quite on it certain weekends, but there were weekends, for example, like Turkey, where I thought, compared to what Leclerc was doing, Sebastian was pretty great. Uh, the Hungarian Grand Prix was another one where Sebastian was really on it considering again how poor the ferrari car was for him um and i will say it's a miracle sebastian vettel finished the amount of races that he did considering how undrivable at times that car was and it really was an undrivable car for him and even at times for charles leclerc um he even had you know had some crashes for example the one at the parabolica in monza that was just simply down to the car being horrible to drive uh, and very unpredictable as well. Um, yeah, Ferrari season. I mean, like I said earlier, it could have been worse, but not much worse. I don't really see it getting that much better in 2021. I think we, if you're going to look at Ferrari and where it will get better, you've got to look really at 2022 and beyond. You can't really look at 2021 because, I mean, yeah, let's say they finish fourth. Not really going to matter that much, is it? I mean, it's Ferrari. They should be the top two in the constructors at least every single season so there you go but now let's get into the final four teams uh first off out there's four alpha tauri in p uh seven i think alpha tauri even though they did lose a position on what they did in 2019 did a pretty good season pierre gasly one of the drivers of the season of course the race when he got at monza was so special in terms of it you know the moment that it was of course, a lot of things had to happen for that to happen. Um, but just an amazing moment that was. And he... I mean, did he deserve to win that race based on what happened in the Grand Prix? No, probably not. But I think Pierre definitely deserved another great moment based on how he drove in 2020. I mean, not all of the season, but I'd say 90% at least of the season. Pierre Gasly was at the absolute peak of what he could do currently as a driver. Uh, plenty of times getting into the points, getting, you know, a few points here and there, keeping Alpha Tauri relevant enough in the battle for sixth in the constructors they were having with Ferrari. And yeah, I think Pierre, again, great season. And I think definitely could still get better. How much better? I'm not too sure, but I think he can definitely improve. Uh, Danny Kvyat, of course, he's on his way out. I think Danny Kvyat honestly had good race performances, but was simply too slow in qualifying. His great qualifying performances at the end of the season came way too late. 
if he started doing those uh, around race four or five, he probably would be still in the car for 2021. But um, yeah, for Alpha Tauri this season, not this season, but you know, 2020. Again, even though they lost a position in the constructors, I don't think you can say it was a bad season. I think you could say, considering how big of a team they are, for them to be competing with teams like Ferrari, Renault, Racing Point, McLaren, as they were still, even though they didn't finish, you know, above those teams, they were still competing a lot with them. For them to be in that position and doing it on a regular basis and it, and sometimes, you know, them actually beating those teams, you've got to say that they're still doing the best they can with what they've got. And I still think it was a pretty good season. And they were basically at the level they were in uh, at in 2019. The only thing I th guess you could say in terms of whether they could have finished higher is maybe they could have started the season off a bit quicker because they weren't that quick in the first five, six uh, Grand Prix. And they did end the season very quick. But again, it's Alpha Tauri. You're not exactly expecting them to be, you know, very quick at the start of a Grand Prix season. Um, is there anything, Nib, you can really think of of Alpha Tauri that they could have done better in 2020? Um, not really, to be honest. I mean, you pretty much echoed a lot of my thoughts. So I thought that they were very fast at Silverstone, actually, which uh, I think you, you might have forgotten about when you said first five or six races. T to be quite frank with you, I, once the race is done, I don't remember too much of it, but I do remember that they were pretty pretty nifty around there. I think Gasly got seventh at, at Silverstone. At one of the Silverstone races, I'm pretty sure he got seventh or... Or something like that, but yeah, Gasly was was absolutely incredible, and to to be down in the doldrums like he was after um, the horrible half a season he had at Red Bull, but to pick it back up and to get that race win at Monza was such an incredible story, and certainly the moment uh, of the season. Well, yeah, certainly the moment of the season. I think probably before the first Bahrain Grand Prix. Um, but yeah, no, incredible story. So happy for Gasly. He really showed his true talent this year. And, you know, it's unfortunate that, you know, Alex Albon perhaps might not have that same opportunity to go back into the Alpha Tauri and to show perhaps his true talent uh, against someone like Pierre Gasly, who we know now is a very good Formula One driver. But, you know, that's just how Formula One is sometimes. It is a cruel sport. And, yeah. That's just ultimately what happens. But Danny Kvyat, I thought he actually had a pretty good season. As you mentioned, just a little bit disappointing in qualifying on the occasion. He didn't actually have a too bad of a qualifying record against uh, against Pierre Gasly. Of course, he beat him in the last three qualifying sessions of the season. Those two Bahrain races and an Abu Dhabi. But yeah, just a little bit too late to put all of that in. So yeah, a bit disappointing in the end for... Danny Kvyat to go out of the sport, but he had some very good moments, that's for sure, in his Formula 1 career. And, um, yeah, that was a pretty decent season for Alpha Tauri, and I'd just expect more of the same from them coming into 2021. Um, one last thing with Kvyat. Do you see him coming back ever? Nah, Red Bull have got a pretty... They've got some drivers coming through now. Of course, you've got Daruvala... Uh, potentially year of Ips. Let's see how he develops uh, in this next 2021 20, season in F2. But, you know, I, I don't think Kvyat will, will come back into the sport. Yeah, I tend to agree with you. It's pretty sad because I think Danny's actually had a pretty good career considering the cars he's driven. Um, but, like you said, Formula 1 is cruel sometimes. And yet again, I think has been cruel towards Danny Kvyat. But, there you go. But uh, the final three teams, we'll just whiz through them because, let's be honest, all three of these teams were just real, just dog shit teams in 2020. Um, Alfa Romeo, Haas, and Williams. Two Ferrari customer teams. I mean, they were basically around the same part of the grid all the, all, all the season. Alfa Romeo, I think, had a lot better of a car aerodynamically, for sure, than the Haas F1 car. Um... I think the start of the season, Alpha was struggling a lot in qualifying, but once they got, you know, over those, Alpha Romeo really did pound Haas into the dirt uh, in that mini battle for eighth in the constructors. But 
yeah, those two teams. The reason they were so bad was the Ferrari power unit. It had no power compared to the Merc, the Renault, or the Honda, which is why they couldn't compete, even though I think Alfred had the amount of power they had from the year before. I think Alfa Romeo could have had maybe a few uh, nifty results in 2020, but that's the way it went. I will say, RSF1, at the end of 2020, they were really bad. Really, really bad. They were they were the worst team on the grid by the end of the season. Um, and I think they're lucky to finish ninth. I think Williams really did bottle chances to finish ninth in the constructors ahead of them. Um, and yeah, getting on to Williams. Williams had a lot better of a car this year, which is good. They couldn't really get any worse than the 2019 car. Um, and yeah, I think they bottled chances to get ninth in the constructors. And I think they'll maybe look back on that as a bit of a, a regret because, you know, they had Russell P9 at Imola. He was in that position. Then he, of course, hit the wall under the safety car. He was eighth in Mugello and then got a really poor restart um, on the last restart of that Grand Prix. Yeah, missed opportunities there for Williams, but these three teams were just really bad um, in 2020. And Nib, I mean, do you have anything really to add when it comes to those three teams? Uh, a little bit, yeah. Um, I remember halfway, I think it was, I can't remember when it was, but um, oh, that's right. It was after the the, the Portuguese Grand Prix at um, at Algrave. And Roman Grosjean spoke a little bit about why Haas was struggling so much. And remember how it was something to do with the rear suspension and how that that was causing the car to be really unpredictable in qualifying. I remember it was something about the rear suspension. I can't remember exactly why it was. Um, Overheating? That's that's right. It was the the rear suspension was overheating, and causing there something to be like the there was it was flexing, no not flexing, but there's an article on race fans. I can't remember everything from at the moment, but there's an article on why Haas are struggling, and perhaps because of course the Haas have got the same rear end as the Ferrari, so that perhaps could also have explained a little bit why of uh, why Ferrari was struggling with their rear end. Um. So, yeah, but not much to say about Haas. I thought K. Meg and Grosjean actually had a pretty good season, you know. I think they're two, they're two, uh, they're two very good drivers. And, of course, thankfully, Roman is, uh, is all good. And, um, he, he got his bandaging off of his, uh, off of his other hand today. So, that was good news to see indeed. Um, but yeah, Giovinazzi, I thought he had a very good season, actually. Um, he started to beat Kimi a lot more. I think Kimi started to perhaps drop off just a tiny bit, but I mean that Alfa Romeo car. I mean both of those cars, the Alfa Romeo and the Haas, struggled because of the Ferrari power unit being so poor, and I think that was the main reason of a lot of their drop off. Uh, Williams, yeah, the, good to see them a lot closer. Of course, you know George Russell. I think I think everyone loves George Russell. He had an incredible season once again. Getting into Q2 quite a bit. And then, of course, he's a little bit stint Mercedes. He did quite well. Uh, but, yeah, not too much. But Latifi does need to improve. Otherwise, he will get replaced uh, by Dan Pictum or Jack Aitken. I'd probably say Dan Pictum. Obviously, it depends how he goes in F2 for this season. But, yeah, I think Latifi definitely has to get a little bit closer to, uh, to Ruff Russell if he wants to keep his seat in that Williams for 2022. Yeah, I tend to agree. Probably, it's not much. It, we're not talking, you know, half a second it needs to improve by, but a, a couple tenths of a second, I'd say. If he can improve by that, then he'll probably end up getting a few decent qualifying uh, results, at least from um, 2021, and that should spur him on, maybe for a points finish. You never know. If you actually look at a couple races in 2020, he did pretty well, Latifi, in certain races. I think the Italian Grand Prix is very close to a points finish there. Um, so his race pace is fine. It's just, yeah, qualifying compared to Russell is just lacking uh, quite a bit. Not as much as um, it was for Robert Kubica, though, compared to Russell, which I guess is a plus for the Williams team. But yeah, those are the teams and drivers. Now we'll get on to the final couple topics. Um, we'll get into first... 
top three races of the season. Now, I'll go first because I of Nib. I'm a sure wants to think of what his top three is. Um, so third, I am going to go for the Portuguese Grand Prix from Portimao. The reason is because the race. The thing I loved about the race, and the only downside of the race is the DRS was too powerful. I think we would have had some great battles without it. Um, we were robbed of some great battles, even though we did get some anyway. Perez and Ocon being one, that was a great battle for half of the lap almost uh, between those two. Um, but yeah, the thing I loved about that Grand Prix, it was it was constantly moving around in terms of who could finish where in that top 10 or even in the top four or five it wasn't certain of right this is going to be basically the finishing order you know what we got for example in the final grand prix in abu dhabi where we knew what the finishing order was going to be for most of the grand prix in that portuguese grand prix you didn't really know until the end until the very final lap because it was so close in that midfield uh, pack and we even got you know battles for the lead of the race between Hamilton and Bottas, and even then it looked kind of uncertain as to who was going to win the Grand Prix up until Lewis Hamilton, of course, passed Valtteri Bottas. Um, but in that Grand Prix, especially in the midfield, it was just a case of anyone could have finished, you know, wherever in that, you know, pack of cars, and it was so exciting to watch. And certainly the first two or three laps of that Grand Prix were one of the most exciting starts to a Grand Prix I think I've ever seen to be honest and yeah it was just it was it really was great uh the second best Grand Prix of the season for me would have to be the um 70th anniversary Grand Prix the reason being is because of well the main reason is the battle we got for the lead uh for the win between Max Verstappen Valtteri Bottas and Lewis Hamilton and and Kind of similar to what I just said about the race in Portugal. You didn't really know who was going to finish where in that top few positions because it was constantly moving around and, you know, the situation was evolving constantly. It wasn't just, you know, certain this is what's going to happen again, like in Abu Dhabi. It was, you know, you didn't know for sure who was going to finish where. Of course, the race started. It was Bottas from Hamilton from Verstappen. Then Verstappen um, overcut his way past Lewis Hamilton. Then Verstappen passed Bottas. Then Bottas kind of stayed close to Max. And then Hamilton stayed out for quite a bit. Then pitted. Then came back through the field. I was getting close to Max, but just missed out on um, having enough time basically to catch uh, Max Verstappen. I thought, yeah, the battle for victory was great. Again, you just didn't really know for sure who was going to win, really, until the final couple laps, which is what we wanted in Formula 1. Uh, a proper battle for very important positions. And even in the midfield, it was the same. You didn't really know who was going to finish where. And I think, you know, the tyre situation made it very interesting. It was very hot Grand Prix, which the teams I know weren't expecting at that Grand Prix. And that definitely made it very interesting. Um... And yeah, I thought it was just a very, very interesting and exciting Grand Prix. But the best Grand Prix of the season for me has to be the Eiffel Grand Prix at the Nürburgring. Those first 30 laps were, were so much fun. So much fun. There was something happening every single lap, whether it be Ricardo passing Leclerc for, uh, what was it, fourth place or fifth place? Bottas and Hamilton fighting for the lead. Uh, you know, battles in the midfield between Perez, uh, Norris, Sainz. You had Albon coming through the field, getting, you know, in some contact with uh, Kvyat and the Alpha Tauri. Uh, Pierre Gasly making his way through the field. You had Russell and Raikkonen at the back. And again, the first half of that Grand Prix was so exciting. And even the 10 laps after that were pretty good as well. The only bad thing was that the safety car came out the final, what, 15 laps. We well, didn't come out for the final 15 laps, but came out and, you know, the race after that, um, the restart after that, for the final 15 laps or so, it was kind of mediocre end to what I thought was a very good Grand Prix, but it, the Grand Prix I enjoyed the most would have to be that Grand Prix. But Nib, uh, what would your top three be? Okay, well, I'm going to go from first 
because I know absolutely what my favourite Grand Prix this season was, and that has to be the Turkish Grand Prix. And, I mean, obviously a lot of it was down to it being wet and the track surface being so uh, so slippery. But that Grand Prix, the race, you were on the edge of your seat uh, for the whole entire race because you never knew quite what was going to happen in that race. And, of course, Lewis Hamilton winning his seventh world title there. Quite a memorable race. Vettel back on the podium. You know, there are a lot of great moments throughout that race. Of course, the racing points being very quick. You know, there was a lot of good moments. There wasn't so much overtaking, but it was the spectacle around the race. And then the way it finished with the absolute best drive probably of the season by Lewis Hamilton. Or certainly his best drive of the season, perhaps. Not the best of the season, but certainly an incredible drive by Lewis Hamilton to win the Grand Prix. So the Turkish Grand Prix has to be my first. Um, my first. Now I'm probably going to go with the Italian Grand Prix as the second. Also, just because of the story of Pierre Gasly's win, and it was quite a chaotic, and uh, it was quite a good race, although it, it seems so long ago, and I don't remember too much of the race. Uh, and then in third, I'm going to go for the race at Mugello, or the Tus Tuscany Grand Prix, or whatever it's called. The race at Mugello, I, th I really did enjoy that race, and uh, it was nice to have a little bit of a battle for the podium in the end with uh, Ricardo. And uh, Stroll, and there was quite a nice battle developing with Stroll, uh, Ricardo, and I can't remember who else there for fourth um, at a stage in the Grand Prix. So that it was, it was a very good Grand Prix, I thought, the Mugello Grand Prix. And there was quite a lot of concern going into the Grand Prix that there wouldn't be quite a lot of overtaking there. And it actually turned out to be there was quite a decent amount of overtaking and a lot of side. There was a lot of battling through those long corners, but because you could take different lines, it wasn't just one line that you had to take through those fast corners. The dirty air didn't affect things too much. So the Mugello Grand Prix was actually very, very enjoyable as well. So that that would be my top three. There was a lot of actually very... No, there was a lot of decent races this season, so it was quite hard to come up with the top three, but I think the standout for me was certainly uh, the Turkish Grand Prix. I just want to get on to something you said there about uh, best driver of the season. Would you say Lewis Hamilton's was the best driver of the season? Or if you were to come up with someone who you know, who produced the best driver of the season, who would who's the first person who would come to mind as having put in the best drive? I mean, it, it's certainly the one that comes to mind. You know, Mercedes didn't have the best car that weekend for that track because they couldn't fire up the tyre, but... Hamilton was absolutely flawless in that Grand Prix, didn't make a mistake, kept his head cool, and you look at his teammate, his teammate had six spins or whatever in in the end. He had an absolute disaster class of a race, and Hamilton just drove absolutely flawlessly, made the right decisions, and yeah, that's certainly the, the drive that comes straight to my mind for drive of the season, uh, to be perfectly honest with you. I don't have a great memory in terms of things that happened in specific races, but that certainly jumps out to me as the best drive of the season. Yeah, I'd, I'd have to agree. I mean, like you said, they didn't have the best car that weekend. It was a pretty tough Grand Prix weekend for them, and just how he was able to work his way up to first place and then just pull away at such a relentless speed. It was basically a couple seconds per lap until the end of the Grand Prix on tyres that were bald, basically. Just incredible, absolutely incredible performance. And I think that Grand Prix illustrates why Lewis Hamilton is so great. That race just illustrates it completely. I, I, and, you know, there's plenty of other races that do illustrate you know, why he's such a great driver, but that for me is the perfect illustration of why he is so highly rated as not just a great driver, but a great, you know, sportsman in terms of his talent and you know the way he performs and all of that just that performance was truly phenomenal now final thing we'll get into um it's the top three moments of the season now i think the first two maybe the order will be different from us two but i think the first two we kind of know what it's going to be um so i'll start again i'll i think third place behind the two obvious ones I probably have to say Lewis Hamilton's seventh title win because the reason I say that 
is because it's a moment that, you know, similar to, you know, people who experienced Michael Schumacher winning his seventh world title, it's something you're not going to forget. And I think, you know, even if Lewis Hamilton wins, you know, title number eight, title number nine, even title 10, you're going to remember, you know, that Grand Prix and that performance that he put in to win the seventh title and to equal, you know, a record by Michael Schumacher that no one thought would ever be broken in their lifetime, but it was, or not broken, but, you know, equaled in their lifetime, but it was in just, what, 14, not 14 years, uh, 16 years which is not that long of a time, um, relatively speaking. So, I mean, just, again, that is a moment you're going to remember for a very, very long time. Now, the top two moments, in terms of first and second, it's between, for me, and I'm sure it is probably for Nib, uh, Pierre Gasly's win at Monza, and, of course, the Roman Grosjean um, escape from what looked to be instant death um in Bahrain in what was probably for me the most horrific accident I've probably ever seen it was really bad and I still do not understand how he is alive I mean, it is truly a miracle um I'd probably have to go for Pierre Gasly first because of just the way it made me feel in the moment and I did feel more positive of course with that moment than the Grosjean moment of course, the Grosjean moment, it was bad to start off with, but it did become, not good, but, you know, more positive later on in terms of how he was able to somehow be conscious, not, you know, lose consciousness, and come away with, I mean, the injuries he came away with were not that bad, considering the crash. Um, but yeah, I'd have to go Pierre Gasly first, because it just, again, the way it made me feel, and I will admit, I even said it in my Discord, um, I think I've said on stream before since I, you know, returned to the channel that when Gasly won, I did cry. It was that uh, emotional of a moment for me because of the story. You know, Antoine Hubert, his good friend, dying almost exactly a year before and, you know, him having the whole uh, tough time of being dropped from Red Bull, going back to Toro Rosso. And, of course, I did uh, advocate for him you know, being dropped from Red Bull because I just didn't see it going anywhere, him at that team. Um, but, you know, just the whole story of what he's been through or went through in that year from, say, August 2019 till his win in September 2020, that, for me, was just such a special moment that I'll never forget. Um, Nib, what would your top three moments be? Jeez, I could probably extend it out to a to a top 10 to be honest there's quite a lot of <laughs> good moments throughout the season um i think i'm gonna go from first to then all of the other ones i think number one has to be roman grosjean um yeah i mean chaz chaz has uh spoke about it pretty much enough uh absolutely incredible that he survived the accident that he didn't uh that he didn't pass out from the initial impact or go unconscious uh, yeah, very very lucky to have him here, and uh, credit to all the safety features involved that um uh, that allowed him to survive that crash, and of course, uh, the safety, the people in the medical car, Doctor Ian Roberts, and I forgot the guy who drives it. Um, but yeah, credit to them, and of course the marshal that ran across the um ran across the road to uh with the with the fire extinguisher to get to get to him first. Uh, number two, yeah, of course, uh, it's going to be going to be Pierre Gasly winning at Monza. I also did cry. It was such a beautiful moment because, you know, Pierre all obviously gets very emotional and passionate on the team radio, and and to hear that was uh, was absolutely beautiful. Number three, I'm going to go for Sergio Perez win at, uh, at the Sakir Grand Prix. You know, Perez, he very easily could have won a race at Malaysia in 2012 uh, against Fernando Alonso. And uh, to see him finally win a Grand Prix and the race that probably ultimately made up um, Dietrich Mateschitz's mind because, of course, Helmut Marko and Horner wanted uh, 
wanted Perez at the team for 2021, finally made up his mind about who he wanted in the car for 2021 after winning that Grand Prix. So that's going to be my third. Then then purely for... um, Just purely for feel, a number four is going to be when... uh. When Hamilton beat uh, Michael Schumacher's win record at the Nürburgring, and then Mick Schumacher gave uh, gave Lewis uh, one of Michael's helmets, I thought that was quite a beautiful moment. And then number five, somehow this is number five. I probably should have put it up higher, but this is just personally to me. Um, of course, uh, Lewis winning his uh, world title at uh, at the Turkish Grand Prix, and then why not number six? Ricardo's podiums for me um, at um, at Imola and then at the Nurburgring. You know he, he deserved a, he deserved a podium. He thoroughly deserved a podium. He could have been on the podium a lot more than what he had been in the twenty twenty season. So to see him finally uh, get it done and you know holy mac and cheese balls, he finally got a podium. So it was very nice and there, there was quite a lot of. Nice moments, of course. Lance Stroll, his pole position at uh, at the Turkish Grand Prix. There was a lot of you know, Lando Norris at the first Grand Prix. There was a lot of very nice moments uh, in this season. So that's why I've nearly extended it out to about a top ten moments of the season. So yeah, a very a very nice twenty twenty season. That's for sure. Yeah, considering how in general this year, oh, not this year, but twenty twenty was such a bad year. I think the 2020 Formula 1 season did provide us with many uplifting moments, many uplifting moments, and hopefully we get more uplifting stories in 2021, and I don't really see a reason why there wouldn't be more excitement um, and, again, uplifting stories in the 2021 season. But, Nib, you know, thank you so much for coming on this podcast and giving your thoughts as to the 2020 Formula 1 season. Now we can finally put the season to bed and that year to bed and get on to 2021 which i'm sure will be an interesting season i think mostly the field rule in terms of who's where it'll mostly be kind of the same um but yeah i'm looking forward to it aren't you yeah indeed i'm certainly looking forward to the 2021 season of course it doesn't look like it's going to be Opening up at the Australian Grand Prix, much to my disappointment. So, um, yeah, I'm a bit, bit, bit of a bit of a Debbie Downer about all of that. But yeah, it's been brilliant to talk F1 again with you, mate. It's been, it's been some time, obviously, and hopefully throughout 2021, and we get to see many more great Grand Prix. Of course, in these difficult COVID times. But uh, yeah, it's been been great to speak to you again, mate, and hope we can do many more of these throughout the year. Yeah, and I'm sure we will. Thank you again for coming on. Now, quickly, before I come to uh, the end or the very end of this, I just want to let you guys know that there is some content coming up over the next couple of weeks, uh, videos about certain teams and drivers, and a couple little more things as well over this two to three week period. The reason I'm doing, you know, doing this and then uh, releasing a load of more content in this two, three week span is because I want to release it all in this two to three week span so you know i don't release one thing and then you have to wait you know three or four weeks for the next thing and then you know so on and so forth so that's why i've been getting it all done so you guys can enjoy it all in this span of two to three or even four weeks um but yeah thank you guys for coming along you know joining us again for a podcast episode been a very long time and as we've said hopefully 2021 uh, it's just as good, if not even better, hopefully even closer at certain parts of the field. And until next time, it's been me, Chazer HD. Goodbye.